sit back, relax, pour yourself a pina colada, and try to block out the sounds of giant sea scorpions trundling towards you. Welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. Welcome to the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory, the podcast that provides top travel tips for time travellers. I'm your tour guide, David Mountain. This week, we're exploring one of prehistory's hidden gems, the Silurian. Lasting from 444 to 419 million years ago, the Silurian covers just 25 million years of our planet's history. That's less than one third of the Cretaceous. So it's no surprise that the Silurian is often overlooked by backpackers. But if you're planning a trip to the Paleozoic, the Silurian is a great time to visit. With a warm, stable climate, shallow tropical seas cover much of the land, leaving you with countless pristine beaches and tropical islands to explore. The Silurian is also notable for not ending in a mass extinction of any sort, which, as anyone returning from the Permian will tell you, can really end a holiday on a sour note. Sure, the atmospheric oxygen content is only about half of today, so you're going to need to bring your own oxygen supply. And sure, the continental interiors are barren, sunburnt wastelands. The Silurian is worth a visit. After all, this is the period that sees the emergence of jawed fish, terrestrial arthropods, and the establishment of early land plants. It's also the golden age of sea scorpions, one of nature's most sinister looking, but perhaps surprising, creations. To help me uncover the secrets of the Silurian, I've enlisted two experts. Dr. James Lamsdall, a paleobiologist at West Virginia University. Hello. And Dr. Sandy Hetherington, a paleobotanist at the University of Edinburgh. Hi there. So James, to state the obvious, the Silurian is a long time ago. I mention this because when I look at a map of the Silurian world, frankly it bears no resemblance to the planet Earth that I'm familiar with today. So how do I make sense of this planet, of these continents? And is there anywhere on Earth you'd particularly recommend I visit for my Silurian getaway? Okay, when you're sort of looking at this ancient Earth, the continents in the Silurian, as you said, it's like if somebody's just jumbled up all the pieces on the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the easiest way I find to navigate in the Silurian is if you just remember that there's four major continents and there's this big giant one sitting across the South Pole and that's Gondwana. And that includes a bunch of southern continents today, like it's got Antarctica in there, it's got Africa, it's got Australia. But then up at the equator, there's these three smaller continents. And over the course of the Silurian, actually, they're sort of crashing into each other, so they're merging together. But if you think of it as sort of like the Triforce, Up at the north, we have Siberia, which is pretty much as it sounds, includes all of Siberia. To the west, we have Laurentia, and that's North America and Scotland and Northern Ireland and a few small bits like that. And then to the east, and this is the one that is moving quite quickly towards Laurentia, there's Baltica. And that's got all our Baltiscandian countries, it's got England and parts of Europe as well. So if you could sort of remember those three in relation to each other, and then Gondwana in the south, you'll be good to go. They're all pretty interesting. I think we know the most about Baltica and Laurentia, so if you want to know that you'll definitely see stuff, those are the two to go. There's shallow seas all over them. There's tons of life there. If you want to have a bit of an adventure, go around Gondwana, because there's a lot about Gondwana that we don't know in the Silurian, and if you want surprises, that's probably the place to go. That's very enticing. Okay, so you've mentioned the shallow seas, and with those seas, you have a lot of very nice beaches in the Silurian. So if I was looking for a beach holiday, for example, are there any land animals on these beaches or near water that I should be looking out for in the Silurian? Do they exist yet? We are starting to see life on land. This is driven, I think, in a large part because we're starting to see plants on land widespread for the first time. Because we've got those plants, stuff is now definitely starting to move onto land and take advantage of that. 
It's all arthropods, though. So we have evidence from trackways and from coprolites, actually, that we have millipedes and things like that eating some of these spores up on land. We know for a fact we have two types of arachnids. So we have some of the earliest scorpions moving around on land, and we have another type of arachnid that we don't have today called trigonotarbids. And trigonotarbids are kind of small, they look like heavily armored spiders, but they don't have any venom and they don't have any web. So they're just running around eating presumably each other and most of the things would have been eating each other and the millipedes, I guess, because there's not much else <laughs> on there. So you might see those, but nothing particularly big. I think the largest thing you'll probably see will be a few centimeters at most. Okay, so we're not talking about a carboniferous world of giant arthropods here. It's still in the realm of creepy crawlies. Yes, definitely. Okay. So if I want to see something other than these early arthropods, I need to head into the shallow seas. Mm -hmm. So if I venture into the waves, if I do a bit of snorkeling or scuba diving, what groups of animals do you think I'm most likely to encounter? And am I going to recognize any of these from the present day? There is so much in these Silurian seas. Obviously, during the Ordovician, we see this big burst of diversification of groups that we might be familiar with, and we're really seeing the results of that, basically, as we come into the Silurian. We have, I think I'll start with things that don't move, and then <laughs> progressively get more motile. I think that seems like a good way to do it. So we've got corals kicking around. We're starting to see corals that are colonial. So we've got several different individuals all living in this one shell. They would look very recognizable, but they're not actually the corals that we see today. They're another group called tabulates. And so these will be basically forming rock-like structures, and there'll be a lot of life living around those. Things that you'll definitely recognize from the fossil record, we have brachiopods. They look a lot like our bivalves, but they're doing rather well. We still have them today, of course, but they're much, much rarer. If you go, I think if you go snorkeling around some of the coasts of Scotland today, you can find some in deeper waters, which look fairly similar, actually, to some of the things we find in the Silurian. Aside from that, we still have trilobites, maybe a bit less diverse than they used to be, but they're still there. Orthocone nautiloids, so these big straight shelled things that are basically closely related to ammonites but they haven't started coiling yet. Then we have various sort of fish. We've got our jawless fish with their dermal armor, so they've got this bone growing in the surface of their skin. They're swimming around. We also have acanthodians, which are a weird group. They're called spiny sharks and that's basically exactly what they are. We now know that they are related to modern sharks and they're called spiny sharks because their fins, basically, they just have this big bone spine that they then just grow a fin off. Aside from that, there's just a few other arthropod groups. In terms of things that we'd be more familiar with, there are a couple of crustaceans that we'd recognize. There's some philocarids, which aren't that common today, but they're called pod shrimp. They basically look like a shrimp or a prawn that's got this big double-shelled sort of carapace over the head. And then there are actually ostracods. Ostracods look like swimming beans. Uh, the, the ones we find in the Silurian come from groups that we see today. So that's one of the few things that you could probably recognize directly. And then the last thing that would probably be very common is my personal favorite, which are the Eurypterids. Now, I'm glad you mentioned the Eurypterids because they are high on my list of things to see in the Silurian. In the guidebooks, they're often described as sea scorpions. Mm -hmm. But this being prehistory, I'm guessing they're not actual scorpions like I know from the Holocene. So what are these animals? For a start, they're fantastic. You're right, they're not that closely related to the scorpions we have today, or indeed the scorpions that were walking around on these beaches at this time. They are related to arachnids, but they're sort of potentially their closest ancestor. So we know that Eurypterids did not have any kind of sting, like you associate with scorpions. There were a variety of different groups, but a lot of them swam. They had these paddles at the back of their heads that were modified legs that allowed them to swim. But we do know that they were able of being at least slightly amphibious, at least as amphibious as modern horseshoe crabs are. Horseshoe crabs not being true crabs at all, but also quite closely related to arachnids. And there's evidence that some of them were starting to develop modifications to their gills so they could actually breathe air as well. So they might have been able to spend a bit longer on land. So they're they're kind of pre-gaming being arachnids in a way. They're definitely on the way to it, but they're not there yet. And they're carving out their own very successful habitat within the waters, 
doing the kind of things that I think we'd normally associate crabs and lobsters and things like that doing today. Okay. That's interesting because Eurypterids have a bit of a reputation as some of prehistory's bad guys. The impression backpackers like me get is that they're all big, sinister killers. Is that true, or are they a more diverse group than that? They definitely were doing a lot of different things. I think there is definitely something psychological about thinking about, or certainly even seeing, large arthropods. And by large, I just mean anything that's bigger than five centimeters. That immediately seems very concerning to us. So there were some big predators amongst them, but they were definitely doing other things as well. They have a really long evolutionary history. So we actually first find them in the Ordovician. The Silurian is far and away their heyday. It's where they are the most successful. But they actually continue all the way until the end of the Permian. And so I think one of the only ways you could do that, have almost you know 150 million years of successful evolutionary history, is to be diverse and to be doing different things. So we have some that were, as I said, actively swimming. These are the ones we find lots of. There were definitely predators amongst that, but there were some that were probably cracking open bivalves and other shelled creatures that they were finding in the sediment. But there were also some that were just walking around. They didn't have this modification for swimming at all. And some of those were probably scavengers. It's been suggested that some of them might have eaten algae or plant material, although that's really difficult to say for sure. So if you find out, that would be fantastic. I'll let you know. Um, but then there are also some, and we first see these occurring in the Silurian, and these are some of the ones that do really well as we move on throughout the rest of the Paleozoic, that seem to be almost becoming planktivores in a way. They start doing what we call sweep feeding. And this is where you just develop spines on your legs and then sweep them a bit like a dragnet. And so you can entangle up lots of smaller prey, basically. And they probably started off with things like worms and stuff like that. But by the time we get much later on in the evolutionary history, they've developed weird combs on their legs and seem to just be scooping up plankton and pushing it into their mouths. And they get really big as well, so they sort of are doing kind of like what whales end up doing. That's good to know that they are this much more diverse group than I've been led to believe, certainly. You did mention, however, that there are some large ones there. Mm -hmm. So just from a practical point of view, are there any that could hurt me? Do they pose any risk? Could they ruin a holiday? <laughs> um... Certainly the pterygotids, which are these ones where they have these big claws on the front, and these aren't actually the same pincers that you see on a scorpion. They're actually the mouth parts, which have grown really big. They probably wouldn't be interested in a human. They're probably much too big in terms of prey. But if they don't know what you are, or you're in murky water, you never know. And if you're like flashing around the palms of your hands or something, you might look like something tasty. If they nipped you, and some of these things, even in the Silurian, could get to be a meter, a meter and a half long, a bite from that would probably, it would probably ruin your day. I don't think there's any threat to, to life or limb, but it certainly would probably require stitches, which would be problematic, so. Okay, yeah, so I guess don't just go poking your hands into places where you can't really see what's going on. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. Be careful when doing any barefoot paddling. Oof, yeah. Don't let this put you off exploring the Silurian Seas. As James points out, the chances of being attacked by a sea scorpion are actually very slim. And that's why I'm currently sailing in the shallow tropical seas off the coast of Laurentia. Ready and set to go, scuba diving. So let's dive in. In the Silurian, just like the present day, the most dazzling diversity is to be found among the tropical reefs. The reef builders themselves, however, won't look familiar. Silurian reefs were mainly composed of tetracorals and tabulate corals, both of which are now extinct. They were also built up of stromatoporoids, which are like large calcified sponges. These individual reefs weren't as continuous as the barrier reefs of the Holocene. They tended to be a bit more patchy than that. But these patch reefs could still cover truly enormous stretches of the sea floor. During the Middle Silurian, the Michigan Reef Tract in what's today the North American Great Lakes covered about 800,000 square kilometers. 
that's roughly the size of Turkey. Once you get a bit closer, you can easily see, nestled in and amongst the rocky reefs, a wide variety of bryozoans, crinoids and gastropods. And swimming and scuttling over these reefs are conodonts, armoured fish and eurypterids. If you're lucky, you might even see a spiny shark slinking through the water nearby. It's a dazzling, magical sight. If you do decide to go scuba diving on your Silurian break, make sure you don't dive too deep. With oxygen levels around 50% lower than today's, the water below 100 meters is anoxic, meaning that it's pretty much devoid of oxygen. So not only are you going to struggle to find life down there in the gloomy depths, it's a place you definitely don't want to get stranded. So I'd better get back to the surface. If you prefer to keep your feet dry, the Silurian still has something for you. In fact, it has one of the most remarkable things in prehistory for you to see. Sandy, one of the really exciting things about the Silurian is that you can find some of the very first land plants during this period. Now, for someone like me who would like to see these, whereabouts should I be heading? What sort of environments did these very first plants live in? Yeah, so to go looking for the first land plants, I really think we're going to be looking in the kind of places that we see bryophytes today. So bryophytes are the mosses, liverworts and hornworts, which you might see at the side of a stream, shady, damp environment. And I think that's the same place we'd be looking for these early land plants back in the silo. So that'd be my first tip on where to go looking for them. And the second thing to say is in general, we'll probably be in the Southern Hemisphere if we're looking for these early plants, because most of the paleo continents in the Silurian were in the Southern Hemisphere. So that would be the other thing. You'd be looking in these kind of damp, shady environments and you'd most likely be in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay. Now, when I get there, what am I actually looking for? I mean, what did these early plants look like? Did they have leaves or seeds or other planty things? If you're used to seeing forests that we see today, it's going to be looking quite different. Again, I think some of the best analogies might be things like moss today. If you're looking at a bed of moss, so standing up here, you're looking down and seeing this vegetation, which is probably only a few centimeters high. It's kind of a green fuzzy mass. And if you get down on your hands and knees with a hand lens and take a look at these plants in a bit more detail, the first thing you're going to realize is there's no obvious leaves or roots. The main kind of bodies of these plants seem to be these small little branching stems or axes. So we call them axes often because there's not a clear leaf and there's not a clear root. So axes seems like quite a good term. We can call them little branching stems coming out from this kind of green fuzz potentially on the ground. So these small little branching stems are about a centimetre or so, a couple of centimetres in height. And at the tips of these stems are these little disc-like structures, which are their sporangia. So these are the reproductive structures. So yeah, that's what they look like. Very different to most of the plants we're used to seeing today. Definitely. You mentioned sporangia just then. Am I to take it that they reproduce by spores, not seeds? Yes, definitely. Yes. So these are producing spores in the same way that ferns and bryophytes and lycophytes do today. So definitely no seeds yet. We're going to wait quite a few million years until seeds pop up at the end of the Devonian. So very much they're these kind of free sporing plants that are throwing their spores out to germinate. And that germination is really relies on water as well. So they can't be too far away from water for reproduction. It's fair to say that the early Paleozoic is a pretty alien world. So when I'm in these locations, are there going to be any plants that I would recognise from the Holocene, from the modern day, or are they completely unrecognisable to a human like me? In general, they're going to be looking really different. I think the one thing to note is, just based on the direct reading of the fossil evidence, if we're standing around at the end of the Silurian, we will see the first relatives of the lycophytes. So the lycophytes are modern plants such as club mosses today, such as the lycopodiaceae. You see them in a variety of habitats growing on Earth today. And it's at the very end of the Silurian that we start seeing some of their earliest ancestors, which are a group of plants known as the Zostrophiles. And then at the very end, just before we move into the early Devonian, we start seeing things that really do look like lycophytes today. So they've got leafy nations covering their surface, and they've got some small little rooting-like axes as well. So they would be the only ones that really jump out. And I think in general, most of the things are going to be looking really strange. These unusual plants, collectively often called Coxonia, that's the genus they're often grouped into, 
they really don't look like anything you've seen before, really. Tell me a bit more about this Cooksonia genus. So Cooksonia is what we call a paraphyletic or even polyphyletic genus. So what that means is that they're not all in one single group. It's actually an amalgamation of groups that we call Cooksonia. The reason why we can't identify them all to distinct groups is because superficially they look really similar. They're all of these tiny little branching stems with these terminal reproductive sporangia. And we typically only find those reproductive parts, what we call the sporophytes, so the spore producing part of the life cycle preserved. And because they're so small and they look very similar, especially when they're preserved just as compression fossils, we often call these things a number of different species of Cooksonia. Okay, let's talk a bit about the evolution of these early land plants, because this is something I really don't know much about at all. So to start with their origins, where on earth did they come from? What did they evolve from? Yeah, so to go back to the origins of land plants, we're really going before the Silurian all the way back to Cambrian and Ordovician, really. And that's the kind of time when we're predicting that plants came out of the water onto land, and their ancestors would have been what we call the streptophyte algae, and they lived in freshwater. So that's the first thing. They didn't move out of the oceans. They were coming out of freshwater ponds, and their ancestors today are relatively simple. So they don't have a huge number of different cell types. Some of them are multicellular, the modern examples today, but we're still a bit uncertain about precisely what that very early streptophyte algal ancestor would have looked like. So that's, again, going on in the Cambrian to Ordovician. And by the time we get into the Ordovician, we're thinking land plants have arrived and Although we don't have the direct evidence for it, we're predicting that some of these innovations that help plants survive on land were evolving. And actually, the evidence for those innovations really comes from the Silurian, and especially when we've got exceptional preservation in the Silurian towards the end of the Silurian, when we can start seeing these tiny features such as stomata. So stomata are little pores on the plant, and they help plants breathe in some ways. They allow them to get CO2 inside their tissues. They also allow them to move water around the plant by transpiration. So when water evaporates off, it pulls more water up these little shoots. We also find that they have structures called cuticle, so a kind of waterproof covering. Because actually, if you've been living in the water beforehand, losing water and taking in water isn't really much of an issue. But as soon as you're on land, drying out is a real, something you want to avoid, as is UV. So both of these two things, the cuticle is really, really key for these features. And then the final one that we see evidence of in the Silurian is the origin of these water conducting tissues. So the xylem, which you might have heard of, which is the tissue which transports water, we find the very earliest evidence of xylem on the Silurian as well. So lots of these, what you call key innovations for plants on land, we have our first evidence of in the Silurian. In a previous episode, you were guiding me through the forests of the Devonian. And the Devonian really was a remarkably diverse world to visit. You've got the small moss-like plants, but you've also got larger plants, shrubs, undergrowth, and even trees. By comparison, not to diminish its importance, but the Silurian seems a little bit impoverished. Is that just because there were fewer plants? Or might there be other reasons why? Yeah, that's an absolutely fascinating question, and one that researchers have spent a lot of time thinking about, because we see this explosion in diversity in the early Devonian. And the question is, as so often with fossils, is is this a real explosion in diversity or is this some sort of bias in the geological record? And actually, from examining the rock record itself, we find that there's almost no terrestrial rock preserved from the Silurian period. However, the amount of terrestrial rock really increases in the Devonian. And so one of the key things about the Silurian is we barely have any rocks to work with, really. In most cases, when we're looking, I think basically in almost all cases, when we're examining plant fossils from the Silurian, these are in settings where you've had an ecosystem where bits of plants have been washed into rivers and in, in lots of cases washed into the sea and preserved there. And so in actual fact, one of the most interesting things about the Silurian is how much we don't know. Because lots of these groups, these key groups like the lycophytes and this big diversity of plants really kicks off at the earliest Devonian. However, there's a good chance many of these groups have much more ancient histories during the Silurian itself, and we just don't have records of them. And that's in general when we're looking at the, the body fossil records or the macro fossil record. Now, plants produce lots of spores. That's their kind of micro fossil record. And from examining these spores that get, you know, they're blown by the wind, they're blown into the water, 
we know that during the Silurian, there must have been a much larger diversity of plant life around, much larger than you know this limited amount of evidence we've got from the megafossil record. So yeah, I think in actual fact, that diversity we see in the Devonian had a bit of an earlier origin in the Silurian, and yet currently it's not possible to investigate it as much as we'd like. It's one of those fascinating but slightly infuriating things about the fossil record. It's almost teasing the diversity that must have been there and we just can't see. Yeah, exactly. Today, plants, among many other things, have enormous impacts on the ecosystems around them, on the entire planet, whether it's soil formation or carbon capture or transpiration or a thousand other things. Were plants, even these really small primitive plants in the Silurian, were they also ecosystem engineers in this way, maybe on a smaller scale? Yeah, that's exactly what we think. So although it's, again, difficult to quantify and we have to rely on modern analogs, so experiments with modern species today and, and modelling, we definitely do predict these early plants and also the network of other organisms they're interacting with at that time as well, especially fungi and some of the other algae on land, would have had a real profound impact. So we're getting these earliest kind of soil-like structures that we call cryptogamic covers. So again, if you look sometimes at the covering of rocks, you see there'll be a mass of moss-like things, but also some lichens and maybe some of the kind of microscopic features. So you can imagine bits of the earth that weren't too extreme might have been covered with these mats of organic material. And so they're beginning to photosynthesize more. We're getting changes in oxygen levels. They're changing weathering rates on the surface as well. They're often secreting organic acids, which are interacting with rocks and sediments. And also, even at this very early stage, you can imagine that if you have a time when there's nothing growing there, as soon as you get things growing, they're definitely changing the way that sediments around them and soil horizons are beginning to build up, even if they're not these big, deep soils we're familiar with today. So they definitely had a profound impact on the early earth. The places that we find these early plants, we're talking about wet areas, the edges of rivers, sites with fresh water. They've been around for a while. They were there before the Silurian, before the Phanerozoic even. So why isn't it until the early Paleozoic that we see land plants evolving? What was preventing the emergence of land plants earlier in the Precambrian? A fascinating question, and again, one which I'm sure people will continue to debate and ponder for many, many years to come, because there simply isn't a really good answer to this question. I think one point which might be potentially interesting is really about the fact that I think it takes a very long time. So we have simple unicellular life, early eukaryotes. They're evolving much, much earlier in the geological record, billions of years earlier. And then to move from that point to when we can have these more complex multicellular organisms, there's a huge amount of time. And I think in reality, a huge chunk of that is that evolving all the machinery a cell needs to undergo all these really complex metabolic processes, coordinating your division, interacting with your neighbors, all of these things actually take a huge amount of time, even though all we can see from the outside, from our perspective, is still you know one or two cells. So I think that could be one reason. It just probably takes a good billion years or so to go from these early eukaryotes into, into more complex eukaryotes. That's a really good point because from my multicellular bias, I look at single cell things and think, oh, well, it's, it's not really doing much, but then a cell is doing a thousand things. So that's a really good point. Quite unusually for these prehistoric destinations, the Silurian doesn't end in a mass extinction, which is very nice. So, James, do the animals and the ecosystems of the late Silurian simply continue unchanged into the early Devonian, the next period? Or is there some shift in the assemblages over this period of time? So, the Silurian is a really interesting period of time because it's really volatile. It's actually one of the shortest periods that we've defined within Earth's history. And one of the reasons for this is because it's really a time of transition from what we're seeing in the Ordovician to what we're then going to be going into in the Devonian. And so during the Silurian, we've got periods of anoxia, where basically oxygen depleted waters began to spread out. And we see a lot of species evolving and a lot of species going extinct. There's a high turnover. And so this is actually quite good from a biodiversity perspective as long as this continues, because you've basically got a lot of species arising and then you've got some going extinct but you've got just a large number of species constantly sort of coming about as we move into the devonian what we really see is a decrease in this volatility 
And so if you are one of these groups that undergo this shift and there's tons of species, you're going to do great. And if you're one of these, basically, I call it boom and bust evolution. If you ended on a boom, you're doing really well. If you ended on a bust, it's going to be a hard time because we see lower levels of speciation in general throughout the Devonian. And so at the very start of the Devonian, it looks an awful lot like the Silurian. But then we see these weird kind of trajectories starting to play out where some things are just waning and others are doing very well. And that's going to fundamentally change what we see in the seas. It's just it takes millions of years because it becomes a much more gradual, drawn out process. And so sadly, for me, at least one of the major things we see is that Eurypterids go from having hundreds of species, they kind of hit on a bust towards the start of the Devonian. And so we do have lots of Eurypterids around, but we're dealing with, you know, we maybe know of 20 to 30 species at a time. There are obviously way more than that that we aren't finding in the fossil record, but it's an indication that overall the diversity had decreased as we were going into the Devonian. So you are going to see some shift. It's going to be very recognizable, but you will start to notice that some things just aren't around as much as they used to be. Well, I'm about to whip up another batch of pina coladas for my two guests. But before that, there's just time for James and Sandy to each share their one top travel tip for the Silurian. That is a very difficult question. I've got so many different answers I could give. There are so many weird environments where we find, particularly for me, different arthropods that we can't really pin down exactly what they are. It would be wonderful to go to where Herefordshire is today um, look at the communities there. There's some really strange things that we find in nodules. Just exactly what those are would be wonderful. Or even to go to the Pentland Hills, there's this wonderful environment of this sort of sea slope where there are just, we've got about 20 different Eurypterid species all preserved in the same area covered by this ash flow. And to see what was going on there would be amazing. But I think the main thing, this is going to sound like a really weird answer, but back then the moon was much, much closer to the Earth than it is today. Because, of course, the Moon formed when another planet collided with the Earth billions of years ago has been slowly getting further and further away. So given that we know Eurypterids were accumulating, probably in a similar way to horseshoe crabs, and they like to do it on moonlit nights, it would be wonderful to see the accumulation of these arthropods under a Moon that would have been so much larger than the Moon we see today. That would just be amazing. That's quite a beautiful image, actually. I really like that. <laughs> and how about you, Sandy? So for me, the site that I really want to go to, it's actually in the UK. It's in the Welsh borderlands. So the, the bit of land between England and Wales, which has been home to some of the most important fossil plant findings of the Silurian. And it's been an area which a real hero of mine, Diane Edwards, has worked on for a long time. And that's because we have these really exceptionally well-preserved fossils. And they're exceptionally well preserved because they're preserved as charcoal fossils. And so the one must see place for me would have to be to be in this area to see what was one of the earliest evidences of wildfires. So the charcoal record from this point in the late Silurian reveals that for one of the first times in Earth history, oxygen levels were high enough to enable wildfires to break out. And these wildfires have led to these fossils which have been preserved there these charcoal fossils, which have been so important in our interpretation of these early land plants. And I think it would have just been remarkable to see a wildfire where the vegetation doesn't really go above your ankles. So it must have been this kind of strange smoldering fire at the kind of ankle level. And so I think that for me would be the place I'd like to go and examine these plants and to see first evidence of wildfire on Earth. And all that's left for me to say is thank you very much to my two guests, Dr. James Lamsdale and Dr. Sandy Hetherington for sharing their Silurian travel tips. If you've enjoyed what we've been talking about today, then make sure to check out their research. There are links in the episode notes. And most of all, thank you to you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and if you have, please feel free to like, subscribe, share, and leave a positive review. And I hope you'll join me again for the season finale of the Backpacker's Guide to Prehistory. But until then, safe travels.